Are we okay? Okay, uh, good morning. Thank you all for um, coming today. Um, this is the, the title of my talk. Um, I want to dedicate, I am dedicating this talk to Anthony Bourdain. Uh, Anthony committed suicide about a week ago. Um, Anthony Bourdain, author, celebrity chef, um, host of um, um, Parts Unknown. Bourdain was a badass. Um, he was an unrepentant smoker drinker and former heroin and crack cocaine user, and he was a supporter of, of harm reduction. So I'm dedicating my talk to Anthony Bourdain. Uh, I started this group, it's called The Switch, this is uh, the poster, and I didn't know what to expect uh, when I started this group. Uh, all I knew was I want to get electronic cigarettes into the hands of people who have the highest rates of smoking, who have the highest rates of um, mortality and, and morbidity. And that was um, the sole goal. There was no criteria to be in the group except you have to be a smoker. And I deliberately designed the flyer um, with no scare tactic language, um, don't think you'll ever stop smoking, like you don't have to stop smoking, do you want to try vaping? Um, so um, l letting people come in where they're at, no scare tactics, it, this isn't cessation, not using that word, uh, and then offering people transit cards, because transportation is expensive in New York City, where I live and where I did this group, offering people food and free vaping products. So that was the idea, I didn't know what was gonna happen. I did the group at New York Harm Reduction Educators. Uh, this is an organization that's been around for decades. Uh, it's truly harm reduction based. They meet people where they're at. Uh, people who come to this agency for services, some of them are active drug users. Some people have stopped using and everything in between. So it's come as you are, we welcome you, uh, and we're here um, to offer you uh, assistance. But outside of the agency, everybody is pretty much smoking. This is the sidewalk. It's littered with cigarette butts and uh, um, packages. And so I want to just, um, this is an idea um, that I, I want to communicate to you. So um, going out, so you're going to go out on a Newport. Going out is really slang for you're going to die. And this is a situation that is sort of unique among drug users. So drug users, many, many of them, they stop using their drug of choice, be it heroin, crack cocaine, uh, alcohol, and they work really, really hard to do that really hard to stop. Uh, among people who inject drugs, there's very high rates of HIV, right? Um, they work really hard to take the medications, that regimen of medications every day, and their viral loads become undetectable. Among injection drug users in particular, hepatitis C is very high, very high rates. And they um, do the 12-week course of Harvoni or Salvati, and they get cured. And so what's left? The Newport. So you're going to go out on a Newport after you have done all this work to improve your health, to live, and you're going to go out on the cigarette. No. We have to do something about it. And so this notion of you're going to go out on a new port, it really distills down the reasons we need to really focus on tobacco harm reduction among drug users. Uh, because this is the last drug that's left, and this is the one that has the potential to kill them. Because now they're undetectable, and now they've been cured of, of hep C. So it was a nine-week group. Uh, I started with 10 people. I ended up with five um, African-American and uh, Puerto Ricans. Um, that, that was the ethnic makeup of the group. Everybody in the group at one point had been homeless. Uh, and um, of the five in the group, three people remained homeless throughout the nine-week group. We have a huge problem in New York City of, of homeless. We don't have uh, affordable housing. So it's a real issue. Um, people are poor. Um, they live on social security, which isn't enough to live for most people, or they depend on family and friends for money, uh, or they, they panhandle, they, they, beg, they beg for money. 
everybody in the group had been in jail, uh, in particular Rikers Island, which is a notorious jail in New York City. It's a movement to try to close this uh, jail. And then they had also been in prisons in upstate New York. So all of them have been uh, incarcerated, which is a trauma in, in and of, it, of itself. Everybody in the group was on methadone. Um, the neighborhood that New York Harm Reduction Educators is in, um, there's several methadone programs in that neighborhood. So all five were taking methadone. Uh, the diagnoses um, won't be any surprise to people in this room. We're talking about depression, anxiety. Um, these are the, the major diagnoses. But when I asked people, what do you think is your primary diagnosis? Uh, the majority of them said PTSD. That was the one that they considered. But people in the United States get a lot of diagnoses. It gets very uh, confusing. Uh, I did the Fagerstrom um, nicotine um, test for dependence. And people, um, unsurprisingly, scored very high. I'll just share one um, um, piece of the data. Uh, 10 cigarettes uh, or less a day. So many people had cut down from a pack or two to 10, which is really incredible when you think about it. They had done that over years. So, but they were stuck at 10 for some reason. Uh, so I really look, when I look at the people in the group and at this population in general, I think of smoking in the sense of survival smoking. Their lives are incredibly stressful. Um, they're frustrating. They're anger uh, producing. <clears throat> they have so many strikes against them. And if you're homeless in the United States and you're a drug user, you're criminalized and you're stigmatized and you're despised. And <clears throat> really, if you want to talk about prevention, um, of preventing people from start smoking or helping people stop, you really have to have a discussion at some point about the social determinants that drive people to want to use nicotine and other drugs to deal with enormously stressful uh, lives. Um, Prochaska and De Clemente, really important stages of change. People were highly motivated uh, to change. Um, <clears throat> I always listen for change talks. So in the first couple of groups, I'm listening to why people want to make this change. And all of them were in the action stage. And that's the stage where people really can make um, serious changes. They're also in that age bracket, late 40s to late 50s, where the cumulative effects of smoking are really catching up with them. And they're really feeling it now in a way that they hadn't before. Uh, I asked them how important it was to make the change on that change scale. It was really important. And their confidence levels were really high. So we know when people have confidence to make a change, they have a pretty good chance of actually making that change versus, I don't think I can do it, if you hear that kind of talk. And so the reasons were mostly um, for health. They said things like, I'm afraid to get cancer. I don't want to be disabled. And they're also surrounded by smokers because they're still living in a smoking culture. And they've seen friends and family um, suffer the consequences of smoking. They want to um, very much avoid that. Um, so um, these are some of the people that, that are vaping. Um, so in the first group, I do a little education. I hand out the vaping products. People start using them. And you know, I'm really nervous because I don't know if they're going to like the product. I don't know if they're going to say, this is horrible. It's just not doing it for me. And so people are trying them. We're talking. And then the group is over. And one of the women came over to me. And she just said, in a very kind of quiet voice, she said, it's working. And I knew then, I knew then, um, this could work for some people. Um, so that was a great moment. Uh, and then as time goes on, uh, people felt the health benefits. I can walk up the stairs better. I can taste and smell food better. And those things are very reinforcing, right? If you make a change and your health improves, you will probably keep going. Everybody loves menthol. Here's this flavor wheel. They're not really interested in the flavors. They're really menthol people. They're, they're folks who had smoked uh, Newports for many, many years. Uh, they did try some of the flavors. They would use them as backups. But they're really menthol um, people. <clears throat> so here's the, I don't, you can see. So here's the best place to hold the vape <clears throat> for women, for men. I don't know. You're on your own. Um, and people lost the vape pen. 
people would lose it, and I would give them another one. I had enough that I could do that. One man who was homeless, who was riding the trains, had his backpack stolen with his vaping products in it. So stuff like that happens, and actually all of us lose things, right? It's not just the, the people that that I'm working with. I used uh, Enjoy uh, vaping products. They're pre-filled tanks uh, because they're really easy. I wanted to make it easy for people, not having to um, coil changes and all of that. And um, they really liked the pre-filled tank system, and one person really liked the, uh, the Sigalikes. And then I just want to give a shout out uh, to Enjoy because they really worked with me, and they educated me around the products. And this is a text message that Mike sent to me, and it was really important to, to have their support to educate me so that I could educate the people in the group, and um, this is something that they're very much interested in doing, and I also want to give a shout out to um, Greg Connolly, the AVA, because they gave me a grant to, to do this group, so um, partnering with people in the industry and advocates I think is really uh, important. But the other thing I worried about was they won't charge them. They won't remember to charge them. Um, I was completely wrong. People are charging all the time. They have the portable chargers. They have two or three. They have friends who have them. So nobody ever said, well, I didn't vape and I smoked because I wasn't, I didn't remember to charge. So that was really uh, great to see that. In every group, I discussed dual use. Uh, don't beat yourself up. It happens. You're trying to make a change. You, you might miss smoking. And sure enough, uh, a couple people um, in the dual use phase said, I missed uh, lighting the cigarette. That, was, that ritual piece was important. I missed the smoke. But as time went on, um, those things receded and the vaping um, tasted better and obviously made them feel better. Um, and again, they're around a lot of people who smoke, and that can be triggering. So we also had discussions about what are you going to do when you're around folks who are smoking, and they said, we just start vaping like crazy and we walk away. That's what we do to deal with the, that triggering uh, situation. Um, vaping in homeless shelters. How, how could that happen? People, when they're allowed back in, they spend a lot of time in the shelter. And a couple of the people in the group said, um, and I don't know if this is an anomaly, but the security guard said, we don't care if you vape, vape on your bed, um, don't vape in front of the cameras, don't vape in common areas, and you'll be okay. And the security guards, a lot of what they do in homeless shelters is they police smoking, and they confiscate cigarettes sometimes. And they allow them to vape. And so one of the things uh, people in my group would do is they would just lay on their bed and vape, and they watch movies on their cell phone. And that was sort of the vaping and a movie on the phone. That's, that's what they would do. And these two folks were allowed to. Um, who knows, in other shelters, they might they might ban it, but somehow they lucked out. Um, okay. Um, the other issue about how homeless shelters is having them stolen. So a couple people did have their vaping products stolen in the shelter. Not all shelters have places where you can securely lock things up. So that's something that people have to think about. They would put the products under their pillow at night. They would put them on their person. Um, those are kind of unique considerations for people who are homeless, I think. Um, and then participants start to realize things about smoking. As they get distance from smoking and they're vaping, so this is a couple things that people said. They had realized about smoking now that they were becoming vapors. Smoking is work because it's dirty. The ashes get on things and have to be cleaned up. Burning clothes and other objects. You have to wash smoky clothes. It costs money to clean up. Um, they would waste cigarettes when they don't smoke the entire thing. So now they're starting to look at smoking as causing problems and a lot of work to maintain that and, kind, and can be kind of dangerous. Um, and then there's social costs. I can't be around my grandkids if I'm smoking, but I can if I'm vaping, those sorts of things. They don't feel the stigma as a person who vapes versus smoking. So again, those are reinforcing things, I think, to continue vaping. The other thing is people in the group 
started telling everybody who wasn't in the group about how amazing the group was. So every time I would go to the agency, I would be besieged with people who want to be in the group. Why can't I be in the group? Why can't I be in the group? So for the next group that I do, I have a, already have 10 people, and I have a waiting list. So it's really, really popular. Um, the word got out very, um, very quickly, which is great. I want to just say something about Addiction to Change. This is a really important book. If you haven't read it, I, I highly recommend it. And what De Clemente is arguing is that drug users put an enormous amount of creative energy, time, and planning into procuring their drugs. They have to get the money. They have to find the drugs. They have to talk to people. They have to network. And if you can turn all of that energy that's going into procuring heroin or other drugs, you can turn that, and in this case, into vaping. All of that energy can go into maintaining a healthy uh, way to get nicotine. Um, so that's something for, for people to keep in mind. Drug users actually do a lot of work to maintain their drug use. And if you can just turn that into vaping, um, it, can, it can work. They have the tools to do it. I just have a couple funny anecdotes. Um, one participant, his son, saw him vaping, and he said, Dad, you're smoking crack. You know, you said you stopped. And he was like, no, 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 this is vapor. It's not, it's not crack smoke. And then another woman said that she used to chain smoke after she would smoke crack to mask the smell of the crack so that the police um, wouldn't catch her smoking crack. And I had no idea that you could mask the smell of crack with the smoke um, of tobacco. I don't know if the vapor from a vape pen will mask the smell of crack, but I thought that was an, an interesting observation. By the ninth week of the group, they had all switched completely to vaping. Five, the five people who remained completely switched. Um, didn't report any dual use, and um, again, familiar to people in this room, um, they don't like cigarettes anymore. They don't like the taste. Um, they don't like the smoke. Um, they're really beginning to develop a vapor's identity. And uh, you know, this wasn't a study. This, you know, I, I don't have all kinds of data. This was a pilot group. Um, so I, I'm choosing to believe them that they are um, completely um, switched uh, to, to vaping. The other thing they said over and over and over again, vaping changed my life. It changed my life for the better. And they were so proud of themselves because they had all tried the, the classic NRTs and surprise, surprise, they, they didn't work for them. And this is where I have to say, forcing people to try NRTs over and over and over again is a really bad idea. Um, because what it says to them is, you're the failure. And that's not true. The NRTs, the gums, the patches, they're failing our the people we work with, not the other way around. And vaping is something that they can succeed in. And it's empowering, and people used um, that, that word. So they started out calling me the cigarette lady. And I was like, you can't call me the cigarette lady. If you want a name for me, call me the vaping uh, lady. Um, and they wanted to give me a lot of credit. And I was like, no, no, no. I provided the product, I'll take credit for that, but you did the work. I didn't do it, you had to do the work uh, to transition. And it was a very humbling experience for me um, because we talk about the people left behind and these are the people who are left behind and if we can just get the products into their hands and give some support, um, people can, can make this transition. My last slide, uh, the exit strategy, so what now? Right? What do, we, what do you do now? I'm not supplying you with the free product anymore. And so we talked about that. They're available, Enjoy products are available in pharmacies. Can you go online? Um, some people um, do have computer skills and they have debit cards. They could purchase um, items, the items online. Some people um, couldn't. Uh, and do you want to switch to another brand? Uh, do you want to try out some other brands that might be cheaper, or might be easier, et cetera? Um, how are you going to budget the money? Right? Um, they're not free, unfortunately. Uh, so I will be following up. 
the five people um, to, to know if they've continued vaping, if they went back into a dual use situation, or if they relapsed entirely um, back to cigarettes. But, um, you know, this was, again, it was, it's a small little group. I'm not trying to claim huge, you know, conclusions, but um, this is the work um, that needs to be done, and I think it's possible for uh, people who have very chaotic lives um, to, to make this switch. Thank you.